Um, and so I'll be talking about interventions for reducing parental vaccine refusal and vaccine hesitancy. And here's the, an outline of my talk. So I'll review the interventions because that was the task I was given, um, both not in just, uh, but specifically focusing on the quality of interventions because we have, discussed, we have seen uh, a review of a lot of interventions and a lot of interventions in development uh, and a lot of promising things that are coming down the pike. But I will, um, I will look at the, the quality of interventions that have been evaluated as an equivalent version of phase three trials in a sense that, uh, that we can take and broadly deploy. Um, and the reason for that is, um, I've, I've been saying for a while now, that we should expect the same rigor from uh, interventions to address vaccination gaps, both in terms of acceptance and other kinds of issues, that we ex expect from vaccine development. Would we feel comfortable um, uh, with shoddy, or less for shoddy is a strong word, would we be com comfortable with uh, um, a with, with certain level of lack of rigor in phase three trials? Uh, would we feel comfortable with that? And if we don't, we shouldn't feel comfortable, we shouldn't apply um, less rigor in, in terms of interventions uh, for, for addressing some of the other issues. I will then change, um, uh, switch to some policy level interventions because we have had um, a, a lot of discussion about interpersonal uh, interventions, but there is another scale uh, of interventions and I will discuss vaccine uh, laws in the US because there's a lot of misperceptions about how these laws, what these laws are and how they work in the US and um, I will d discuss them at, uh, in the context of nudges and then discuss some of the future directions around it. So in terms of a little bit of a warning for um, interventions, it's a little bit of reality check ahead. So we did a review um, of a systematic review of interventions for reducing parental vaccine refusal and hesitancy. So that was focused on refusal and hesitancy. And we did a systematic search um, of, of the of the data um, and the studies that we ended up selecting were from 1990 through 2012. And we focused in this one um, on, only on primary reports of interventions with quantitative um, outcome measures. So I'll come back to that. That's not the only sort of knowledge paradigm which we should focus on, but in this specific, specific study, we, we did focus on that. And we ended up with interventional studies, uh, natural or scientific exper uh, experiment, with outcomes that measure parental vaccine refusal behavior, attitudes towards vaccination, or the uh, intent to vaccinate. So, so we use great criteria, uh, because that's the paradigm that's uh, being increasingly used. So again, we, uh, we wanted to see that what is the level, if we evaluated uh, the, what, what was out there um, against the great criteria, uh, what would we get and what we've, uh, so, so just to um, remind everyone or, or those of you uh, who are not familiar with this, so you start with a certain score and then you downgrade based on the risk of bias using pretty standard methods, um, indirectness of ev evidence, so what they measured versus what we are interested in or what, what actually they intended to measure, imprecision in terms of sample size, con confidence intervals, et cetera, inconsistency across studies. So if you have a domain, what are certain studies saying? Are they pointing towards the same direction or, or there's uh, conflicting evidence? And, and, and then publication bias, standard publication bias related issues. We upgrade it uh, because if the strength of association is overall strong or there's a last magnitude of effect, there is a, a dose response relationship and, and then there's antagonistic bias and confounding. So in this review, we started with 15,000 um, initial hits. We removed duplicates, uh, ended up with, again, a little less than 15,000 and then applied our eligibility criteria um, and got to full reports of, of approximately 600 full reports and then uh, applied it, you know, of further eligibility criteria and got uh, provided a sort of did a de detailed review of uh, 30 studies. One thing that stood out was that 25 out of those 30 studies were, for, were from the US. So not only that we have an evidence gap between the North and the South, but also between, you know, within the developed world, certain regions uh, of the developed world. And so that's, that's a big caveat. 
So there are a few conclusions. First of all, what we found was that most studies scored low on, uh, on, on the grade criteria. So we, it scored, uh, they scored, um, uh, um, the, the scores ranged from one, or one to two, um, which is considered low or very low on the, in terms of the interpretation uh, of some of these criteria. Uh, vaccine mandates work, but they are very context specific. Uh, they may work in certain situations. Most studies evaluating the impact of pa parent-centered information uh, education reported improvement in parents' intentions to vaccinate. However, the attitude change data is, it was a little bit variable. And, and then the intentions in some studies uh, were, uh, did happen without um, uh, change in attitudes. So there are a few ca caveats. The first one is that we, o we only had, in this review, quantitative studies. And that's, uh, I'm a strong believer that we, we need to have multiple paradigms of not just developing interventions through formative work, but also evaluating interventions. So, so this was a limitation, admittedly a limitation, and so, so, so that's a caveat. Most studies were from the US, as I mentioned, and the other thing is I'm a big fan of packages. Uh, in real life, in clinical setting, in public health settings, we have, we apply interventions as packages. And I think we should move towards at least taking the, 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 the initial promising interventions and packaging them together and evaluating them as packages because there are some natural inter interactions and, and antagonisms uh, between these interventions. And so, so that uh, hopefully will provide a more realistic estimate of what works and what doesn't work. And a few important studies have obviously come out since uh, our review. Uh, we ended our, so it was, the, the year was 2012, but the data were through um, uh, July uh, 2012, and that was the last look we had. So a little bit about um, vaccine mandates as, as nudges. So there are a few misconceptions, uh, and, and some of us see that as part of the choice architecture, um, that, that parents have around them when they're making vaccine-related decisions. In the US, vaccines are mandatory at school entry, but these laws per, per, permit certain exemptions from mandatory immunization. So rather than sort of forcing someone and picking up someone uh, and, and dragging them to a vaccination center, they work by challenging the balance, by changing the balance of convenience in favor of vaccination from, from non-vaccination. and. These requirements are state-based, so they uh, and, and there are you know 50 states in DC in the US, so they provide enough variability for us to look at uh, some of uh, uh, some of those things, uh, some of the differences between st uh, states, and there are different kinds of exemptions. But what I like to focus in, in the context of this talk is that the the criteria for granting these exemptions varies from just someone going to the internet and printing a card to actually providing um, a specific reason for their child in their context. So therefore, there is a lot of variability between states, and so there are states with easy, medium, and difficult exemptions. And, and, and what we found was that the rates of exemptions, while the, the magnitude is it's actually, I just want to emphasize, the magnitude itself of the exemptions is not that high. There's a perceptible change um, in, in increase in, in rates of exemptions. And, and they, were, they, they were almost, when we looked at it, they were almost exclusively uh, increasing in states with easy exemption policies. So where, where the balance of convenience was in favor of, uh, uh, was away from vaccination and more towards uh, exemption, uh, the rates were increasing. And we looked at these data more recently uh, the rates are still higher in easy exemption policy states, and they, are, they continue to increase on those states. And states with difficult exemption policies, they are pretty uh, stable. And so, so why do we worry about it? So there are low rates, and, and if you, and, and I, uh, I think in the US, although there hasn't been a direct comparison, so I think on the one hand you take acceptance as, uh, as one entity, and then a bucket of multiple things and clump them together, as um, sort of access-related uh, uh, issues. So acceptance versus uh, access will have similar th things if, if you have these uh, sort of packages around you know, to, to compare. But why do we actually worry about these things? The first thing is that if you look at the state level, it has consequences in terms of actual disease rates. And so we looked at data from 86 through 2004, and we found that states that had uh, easy medical exemptions uh, 
had twice uh, as high rates of pertussis, and even after adjusting pretty aggressively for confounders, we had 50% higher rates of, 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 of exemptions. So these things have consequences. Just to clarify, I don't believe that uh, refusals are the only reason for pertussis rates in the US. I do not even believe that it's the main reason. But I would submit that where, where, where uh, it's very rare in biomedical literature when you have one cause and one outcome. And it's a little bit simplistic uh, to think that we have just a, um, a, a loss of immunity or reigning immunity as the only reason. I do believe it's the main reason. And, and it's not just us. There are multiple groups for, for ages that have shown that it's not just at the state level, but at the individual level, the risk of measles was 22 times, not 22%, 22 times higher in exempt versus vaccinated in a Colorado study by, by, by the CDC, and six times higher for pertussis uh, in terms of, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in exempt versus vaccinated children, and 35 times higher for measles in a national study. Um, and then there have been other studies. So the other reason why we, we are concerned about it um, is because there's geographic variability in vaccine refusal. And so this is, these are data from Washington State. Um, and in this particular year, the, the state level rate was 6%. And if you look at the variability in terms of vaccine exemptions, it ranges from 1.2% to uh, approximately one in four child. But a little bit of caveat, this, this county, while it has higher rates, it's relatively sparsely populated. So, so in terms of the absolute numbers, et cetera, a little bit caution in terms of interpreting it, but still, uh, these are pretty high rates, and there is substantial variability. So what does this variability, does this clustering have an effect? Are there any consequences? So this looks at data from Michigan, and if you look at these data, you, you'll see that you, if you look at the clusters of exemptions versus clusters of pertussis, you find a substantial overlap, and even after adjusting for confounding, um, uh, we find that the, the odds of overlap are 2.7. So, so these things have impact. And a little bit about, you know, when we talk about nudges in terms of part of it is providing information. And one of the potentials, so I'm moving away from, from, from some of the things that states have done to some of the potential interventions, we know that there is variability at the school level. And the variability is pretty consistent between schools if you look at even more micro-level data. And we found in California that private schools have substantially higher uh, rates of uh, exemptions uh, compared to uh, to, to public schools. And, um, and the other thing that, that when we have been talking about providers, so we looked at whether there is a sort of a cohort effect in terms of people who graduated more recently have seen fewer uh, um, so cases of, 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 of vaccine preventable diseases in their, in their careers, whether they are slightly or, or more so gung-ho about vaccines. And we found that overall there is still very high support for vaccines amongst all providers, but it's, there is a, a perceptible trend uh, in terms of less uh, um, appreciation of vaccine efficacy, so this is a composite scale and uh, vaccine safety constructs. So some of our work and other people's work what has been used by advisory committees, et cetera, and, and policy statements in the US, and obviously it's, 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 it's multiple groups work, and there has been a lot of advocacy around it at the state level and in, from both sides. And we looked at what, what has happened to the legislative environment in the US, and we looked at data from 2009 through 2012, and what we found was that there were approximately 36 bills introduced in various states, and 31 of them were for expanding, making it easier to get exemptions, and none of them passed. Only five of them were for sort of making exemptions more rational and making the, moving the balance of convenience in favor of vaccinating versus non-vaccinating, um, and three of them passed. So a little bit about sort of future directions. So I, I believe that these are multifaceted, and one, um, uh, uh, these are multifaceted issues, and one, uh, it, uh, um, one period to focus that we haven't focused on so far enough is pregnancy, even for childhood vaccination. 
because uh, often, even if women have information at the start of pregnancy, there is evidence that there is more accumulation of evidence during pre pregnancy and more thinking about vaccines. So we had uh, uh, testing initially, we piloted it, and now we are moving to the P3 plus phase. The P3 in this is practice provider and patient. Actually, we have changed it to practice provider and, and pregnant woman because uh, uh, pregnancy is not a pathology. Um, and, and so therefore, uh, 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 and, uh, and therefore, um, uh, you know, so we're looking at this multi-component, and, and part of it is the, in, the, in the next phase, the, uh, the individual level is, uh, intervention is actually individualized. So we're looking at permutations based on some of the screening questionnaire, they, 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 f they fill out uh, the, um, uh, the output, the message they get, get is customized uh, to, to what they're getting. But, but we are looking at uh, different components in this context, and these are some package components. Uh, we are also looking at, um, head-to-head uh, -head comparison of gain versus loss frame, so using prospect theory, et cetera, to see if, if that uh, has an effect. So, so the bottom line is a lot of these are testable hypotheses, not all, but a lot of them. And we should be doing, as you know, I'm a big believer in what Brandon has been saying, uh, of field trials. Uh, and we should apply the same rigor to some of these outcomes and using, following that whole paradigm of phase one, two, initial development, preclinical, quote unquote, development, and then field testing of these. And, and coming back to some of these issues in the international context, so I believe that hesitancy is an, a little bit of an issue um, um, in, in developing countries in more mature programs, but there's a related concept in developing countries. Hesitancy is sort of above 90% or above 85% uh, coverage issue. But in developing countries, there's a related concept of vaccine demand. And as, as I mentioned earlier, that if a woman, if you have high demand in a community, mothers are likely to walk that one mile versus half a mile if, if you work on creating enough demand. And that, you know, having worked in multiple developing countries and having uh, done some of these uh, sort of hands-on studies, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I can say that, that, that if you have enough demand in the community, you, um, you have, uh, uh, you know, you, you address uh, uh, some of the coverage issues, certainly not all, and you cannot, if you don't have vaccine, you can create as much demand as you want, and you're not going to get uh, children vaccinated or, or adults vaccinated. So we are piloting some of these packages in collaboration with, with diff different partners, and one, of, one example is looking at uh, usual package of intervention in the context of uh, PCV introduction uh, to increase overall coverage, and, and the common package of introduction is that we took uh, ev other evidence-based interventions and packaged them together, um, and then the other arm, um, one of the arms is this quality improvement paradigm that some of the clinicians may be familiar with, but it has now been applied uh, to some global health circumstances. So, so we, the, the, the plan, do, study, act cycles, and so we're evaluating in this context. I don't know whether it will work. It looks promising, and that creates the genuine equipoise, and therefore we need to evaluate and move away from wisdom-based interventions to actual evidence-based interventions. Thank you.